everybody. Welcome to a brand new episode of the Geek Buddies. Hey! The clap really helps. The clap oh, thank does you. Help. Thank you. Uh, you know, <laughs> somebody asked me. Somebody asked me the other day. They're like, "Why do you guys do that?" And I, I revealed the the, the dark oh. secret of the Geek Buddies, which Uh-oh. is. The very first time when we did our very first podcast, audio only at Johnny's, yeah, we just did it. Yeah, it was totally organic. <laughs> there was like uh, nobody, no nope, kind of yeah, nobody talked about it. It was yeah. a weird thing we did, and we've done it hundreds of times since. <laughs> I think it separates us from all the other shows. I think that's what I, it does. To be honest with you, that's the one. That's the thing yeah. that did it. Yeah. So if you want to judge us. You go ahead and judge us. Wow, I was yeah, just I'm making sorry. an observation. I'm sorry. sorry about that. Oh, Jesus, I got a little, I got a little heated, got a little hot on the collar. No, I'm excited. <laughs> uh, thank you all so much for joining us here today on the Geek Buddies. We've got so much to get into. Uh, but first, we'd be remiss not to say a huge thank you to all of you who've been enjoying our Wandavision reviews. Uh, our last one, uh, climbing up past eighteen thousand views insane to think about you know so thank you all so much you know we did a one and two is one three is one four is one now our last one is five and we will be back again this weekend for our review of episode six um you know i was worried i don't know about you guys but i was worried because it was a two-hour review i wasn't sure people were going to want to necessarily listen or watch a two-hour review and i'll be damned if they didn't at uh, really good numbers for the channel so thank you all so much uh, and don't forget, you can always listen to them as well on the Geek Buddies podcast feed. It is a separate feed. Just look for The Geek Buddies, and you'll find it there wherever you download podcasts uh, and what have you. So, um, all right. I am the outlaw, John Roca, writer, producer, and host here on The Outlaw Nation. To And I'm joined by these two gentlemen as my co-hosts. Uh, this is Michael Vogel. I am a writer and producer of animated TV shows and movies. And this is Shannon McClung. I'm an animation writer and a television actor where you may have seen me on Modern Family, Brooklyn Nine-Nine, and The Goldbergs. By the way, Lily and I are are taking a trip through Brooklyn Nine-Nine again and enjoying uh, certain episodes. We just saw the, the, I don't know if you guys watched Brooklyn Nine-Nine, all of it, but there's a great uh, sequence where he's trying to be an undercover poker player and uh, uh, Andre Brower is dealing with his addiction to gambling. It is hilarious. (laughs) Very good. <laughs> Brooklyn Nine Nine is a great show. I mean, it is one yeah. of those shows. At least for me, like it's always nice to book an acting job, but it's even better when it's on a show that you watch. Yes. So yeah, sure. you know, I mean, I, I can't tell you how many. I mean, I don't have a DVR anymore, but all the all the DVR episodes of shows that I happen to be on that I don't watch. Uh, <laughs> that would just sit there and gather dust. Whereas Brooklyn Nine Nine, I go back and watch myself all the time. <laughs> wow! <laughs> Woo! Wow! Hello. Okay. Hello. Okay. Hello. okay. <laughs> Good to know. You hear that other TV shows? He doesn't like you. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that's not what we're here to talk about. We're going to get into a lot of uh, a lot of geek news items that are happening in the world of geekdom and nerddom here in the entertainment uh, industry. Um, and for those of you who are new, thank you so much for coming aboard the Geek Buddies Train. For those of you who are not new, thanks for staying aboard the Geek Buddies Train. You know this, but the new people let's explain how the show works. Each of us presents a geek news item. We talk about it amongst ourselves, and then we take a little bit of a mini break and then jump into our main topic. And today, our main topic is going to be addressing the uh, uh, very powerful powerful heartbreaking devastating statements from Chris, charisma carpenter that broke this morning about her interactions with joss whedon while she was working on the tv show buffy and angel with him uh, and the reactions to it and also you know just overall what uh, how we're approaching this new post me Too, post black lives matter world and uh how we feel about finding out about all these things about what we use well, about people we used to respect and we, whose work we used to enjoy. Uh, so we're going to get into all of that for sure. Uh, but first, uh, I think, Michael, you're up first uh, with the first keep news that we're talking about, right? I am. I got a little double double header today uh, yeah. in the world of everybody's favorite web slinger. A uh, couple pieces of important Spider-Man info for all of you Spidey fans out there. First one uh, is that our buddy Tom Holland, uh, who is known throughout uh, the world for not being able to keep a secret on Marvel movies, uh, 
is is apparently um, laying out some truths for everybody. There's been a lot of rumors about Spider-Man 3 uh, involving the multiverse. We know that a lot of Spidey's villains from other Spider-Man franchises will be appearing in the movie. And there's been a lot of rumors about Tobey Maguire, Andrew Garfield, kind of a real life uh, into the Spider-Verse happening with Spider-Man 3. Um, well, in a recent Esquire interview, Holland said uh, that neither Maguire nor Garfield will be reprising their roles as Spidey. He says they will not be appearing in the film unless they've hidden the most massive piece of information from me, which I think is too big a secret for them to keep from me. But as of yet, no, it'll not. It'll be a continuation of the Spider-Man movies that we've been making. Uh, so mm. maybe. I don't know. Well, like, before I get to my second piece of news, uh, you know, Tom Holland, uh, I, I personally think a lot of the Tom Holland uh, spoiling things in Marvel is a wonderfully calculated plan by the Marvel PR team and not him accidentally spoiling things. Oh. But uh, oh. that's just that's just my opinion. You're going to defend but, uh, Tom, but come after John. Okay, I like it. I like it. Cool. It's, it's less of a defending Tom and more of a just saying, this is a really nice PR stunt. Uh, yeah. But uh, I do think, I do think that... Um, not sure. I think that what's going to happen in this Spider-Man 3 is such a giant question mark. Uh, a yeah. lot of what we talk about in our WandaVision reviews uh, about the opening of the multiverse ties into this. And mm -hmm. given that we know some of these previous villains, I think we talked about this previously, that all those villains and more Spider-Men and everything, at a certain point, the movie becomes just too heavy and it doesn't become a continuation of the story that they've laid out in uh, Far From Home and Homecoming. Right. Um, so I, I think it'll be interesting to see, but uh, I, I take everything with a grain of salt at this point. Like, is, are they trying to lead us off the trail or are they not? I don't know, what do you guys think? Well, I don't think that Tom Holland is gonna be the representative, representative to come out for Marvel and say, no, they're not in this. Um, <laughs> but also remember, we have five MCU projects to get through to get to Spider-Man. Mm -hmm. So the idea, I mean, like what? We got trailers for Black Widow. We got trailers for the Disney Plus series. We haven't seen a thing from uh, Shang-Chi or a thing from Eternals yet. And these are yeah. all coming out before Spider-Man. So I think any sort of like big revelations, like Marvel has a very tight lid on what they want to be released. Mm -hmm. So I don't think they had any issue with Tom Holland being like, and you know, there are caveats in that statement. Like, you know, that would be a hard thing to hide from me. That certainly doesn't mean that they can't do it. Um, do I think they're going to be in the movie? As you said, Vogel, um, it, it, that's, it's a lot of movie. It's going to be a lot of movie. And squeezing in two more, two more Spideys would be a, a grand undertaking. I sure hope that we see it. I would love to see the three of those guys on screen together, even just for a moment. Yeah, and let's remember, I mean, uh, Tom Holland admitted that he thought that what they were shooting at the end of Endgame was the, a wedding scene or something, even though everybody's in all black. I don't know how he would think that, but it, he thought it was a wedding <laughs> scene or some kind of celebration. He did not know it was a funeral necessarily for Tony Stark until he got on set. So, yeah, Mike, you might be 100% right that this is a narrative they throw in there because obviously if someone was really spoiling stuff, the studio would be coming down hard on this person with fines and with issues. All of us, I'm sure, have uh, experience with NDAs and what could happen if you violate those NDAs. So to me, it would be kind of surprising that they have a guy who's their prominent Spider-Man who's consistently spoiling stuff uh, before uh, on purpose or, or quote unquote accidentally or whatever. So whatever with that. But I, I do kind of feel like this is an interesting swerve at this moment. Uh, is he trying to preserve the secrets or have they really hidden this from him? And he has no scenes with these guys. Cause that's the concern I have is that they're totally in the movie. They're just in, not in the movie with him. So what does he need to know about it? Well, let me be, let me be clear on one thing here yeah. is that when, no, nothing that Tom Holland says in here is a Tom Holland just shot off at the mouth. Like right. Tom Holland during his Esquire interview has a PR person that is there. Right. And after the interview, if he does shoot off his mouth, has a PR person that will be like, hey, don't say this thing. Right. Like the fact that this is in here means Marvel is okay with him saying this thing. Like this is not a Marvel, like Kevin Feige was like, God damn it, Tom. Like that is not, <laughs> that's not how all this works. So, so Tom's saying this. <laughs> 
whether whether it is whether it is an absolute true statement and they are not in the movie, whether it is sort of a, a wink and a nod and you're gonna see what we meant, like whatever it is, this was a this isn't just Tom Holland just saying shit. Like this is a right. Marvel is letting us know through Tom Holland, I believe. Uh, yeah. may, maybe I could be wrong, but I, I'm pretty sure. You know, I think there's a good chance uh, if if they are indeed in this movie. Uh, rather than just doing live action Spider Verse, which is something we've seen before, perhaps we will see Tobey Maguire. Even though Doc Ock died in Spider Man Two, so I don't know how this works. Like, is Tobey Maguire going to be fighting Doc Ock in his universe, and Andrew Garfield will be fighting Electro in his universe, and something happens, and they get sucked into Tom Holland's universe? So, mm-hmm. in point of fact, Tom Holland is right that he's never going to shoot a scene with these people, and we will still see them in the movie. So, like, there's a ton of possibilities. To mm-hmm. Shannon's point, this is a ways off. We're going to hear a thousand rumors when this trailer yeah. comes out. We're probably going to talk about it on this episode, on that episode for the entirety of the episode so a lot of lot to come um but that is not the only bit of spidey news we have this week uh another rumor has surfaced uh and that rumor from illuminati is that none other than keanu reeves has been offered the role by sony of craven the hunter in his own solo movie uh so this is not part of the uh, homecoming, far from home, Spider-Man three universe. This is part of the Venom, Morbius, Spider-Man villains in their own movies that maybe one day will appear with Spider-Man or be in the MCU or maybe not. Who the fuck knows what's happening because there's so many things happening. But uh, but yeah. So along those lines, this would be sort of Keanu Reeves as the anti-hero, Craven the Hunter. Again, just rumors at this point. Yeah. But. Uh, well, what do you guys think about a Craven the Hunter movie? Listen, there is nobody in the Spidey villain side of things that I love more than Craven the Hunter. Really? Something, something about him. <laughs> yeah, I've always, I mean, Rhino is cool. Green Goblin bores me. Hobgoblin bores me. But like Craven has always been interesting to me. To me, John Roca, not Michael Vogel, John Roca. I oh, no, no, oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, I'm no, clear. No. I'm clear. <laughs> okay, I want to make it clear. <laughs> I just love the idea of a dude who could care less about socks or shirts and roaming around and, uh, you know, kind of tracking him down like he's an animal. There was something always interesting about Craven the Hunter that I found myself drawn to all the time. You never can explain what villains stand out to you. They just do. And Craven always stood out to me. And I liked it. He's a built dude. He's Eastern European. There's a lot of like, they, they put in a lot of his story. They fleshed out rather a lot of his story with some tragedy, with some anger, with some issues he has to explore and resolve. He's not a white. Initially when he was presented, he's like a one note character, but they've done a really good job over the last uh, few decades, kind of building out his character a little more and fleshing it out. And I like that. Give him a little more life. And so you jump into the situation here and you go, okay, this will be fun, but I don't know if Keanu is the way I would go. I mean, to me, Tom Hardy is more the physical look of Craven. It's a wow. big dude, you know, and I don't know that that uh, Keanu radiates it for me. And look, Keanu's not really the best at accents, and I love Keanu, but he's not really the best at accents. So to me, it worries me on that level that we're getting a key, uh, a Craven that's going to be fun, but not going to be Craven. And I think that that's my hesitation here but i don't fault them for offering it to keanu the keanu sans is happening so why not take advantage of it uh mikey please uh, oh no no i want to hear i want to hear shannon's shannon. first i want to hear shannon's shannon. first and then then i'll then i'll respond to that uh that, that stirring passionate yeah. uh-huh. uh, uh 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 love of the eastern european swarthy shirtless man that you have I didn't the say you the said entire swarthy. time that John was talking about his love for Craven, all yeah. I see is a John Roca cosplay with his lion, yeah. with his lion vest and Look his le- leopard print leggings. <laughs> <laughs> Just need to get a six pack someday. Yeah. <laughs> um, eh, you know, Craven's one of those characters that I feel like if he's going to be in a Spidey movie, I, I don't know if he's the guy to be in a whole movie. I thought he and Lizard would be a really interesting uh, villain pair to, to to have together in a film um, as a whole movie. I don't know, man. I mean, they can they can make a whole movie at it. They can make a whole movie at any character. The guy, the, I th- I think there is something there. Um, but Keanu Reeves as Craven, mm-hmm. uh, yeah. I mean, when I think of Keanu Reeves accents, I think of Bram Stoker's Dracula, and you know that was a a long long time ago. Um, but also Keanu as as amazing as he looks. He is almost 60. Wow. Um, so 
again, the idea that you're 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 strapping this potential uh, franchise onto a guy who's almost sixty years old, and it's more than likely going to be a, a, an exceptionally physical role. Um, it certainly can be done. I mean, you know, it's it's not impossible. Uh, yeah. Mission Impossible, because that's the <coughs> guy who does action later in life. Um, but yeah, I just don't think that Keanu Reeves is the guy to play this. It seems like they, if this is actually true, it's more casting a name rather than casting the person that's appropriate for the character. Yeah. Go ahead, Mike. Uh, so I'm the opposite of John. In that, uh, I I think I think Keanu Reeves is perfectly fine. If you're gonna do a movie about a Spider-Man villain and you want a big name, a big name that's gonna that's gonna anchor that movie, sure. My thing is, uh, there have been some rumors early on that John Watts was gonna use Craven uh, in his Spider-Man three, and maybe that was his original plan before the whole multiverse kind of got involved in this. But I was fine with that because I think John Watts has done an amazing job of taking some of the uh, lesser known yeah. or less popular. Uh, Spider-Man characters, uh, the Vulture, guess really well known, but you know, mostly usually seen as an old guy in a weird Vulture suit. Mysterio, kind of seen as like the cheesy sorcerer guy, uh, and really kind of grounding them in a cool and new and interesting way to kind of breathe new life into those characters. So when John Watts was potentially going to do that in a third Spider-Man movie, I was on board. Like he was going down the line uh, of taking these sort of like second tier Spider-Man characters and like rocketing them up to like first tier. Uh, and I was down with that. Craven as a character to carry his entire own movie, Keanu Reeves aside, I just don't know what is really there. Uh, Venom, as much as I dislike the Venom movie, I get it's the symbiote, it's a thing. It's like the biggest Marvel character. Even Morbius with the whole, we're going down this vampire road. It's like, okay, kind of a lesser known Spider-Man character, I can see it. Craven really feels like you are it's not as bad as when those rumors surfaced that Sony was going to do like an Aunt May movie where she used to be a spy or something that was really like, you are really stretching here. But, uh, you know, Craven is like, he's a, he's a hunter. He's a really good hunter. But like when you're not, when he's not, when he's not hunting Spider-Man, uh, which he wouldn't be in this movie, he's just hunting something. I'm like, eh, okay, I guess. I don't know. What's your, what's your, what do you consider, um, Top tier Spider Man villains, exactly. Uh, well, Green Goblin, Venom, mm -hmm. uh, Green Goblin, yeah, Green Goblin and Venom are like the primary Spider Man villains, okay. and Doc uh, Ock. I think Doc Ock's and Doc, Doc Ock, Ock and Doc right. Ock. Those yeah. are the three, those are the three like top tier. Right. Then, my thing with Spider Man villains, even though I do think he has probably the best and most fun rogues gallery aside from Batman, mm -hmm. once you get to sort of like Sandman, Rhino, Hydro, like that level mm -hmm. of villains, when you get into the way they've been uh, portrayed in the comics, even yeah. Scorpion, a lot of it is like a dude in a suit or a dude with a power, but the dude underneath their story isn't that compelling. Now mm -hmm. I will give you that Craven, within all that, uh, does have a more compelling story, is more yeah. interesting than yeah. like guys in suits, but he's not on the uh, Venom, Doc Ock, Green Goblin level. Like his personal beef with Spidey is, I've, I, you are the biggest prey. I shall hunt you. Yes, yes. As opposed to Harry Osborn, why? Um, you get away with everything I want, what you have. Yeah, I mean, it's just like I, I find more connection to a man going after something to hunt it down over a whiny teenager trying to be his dad. I'll give way more credibility no. to that than to Harry or Norman Osborn, uh, for God's sake. So I've never understood the Green Goblin, Hobgoblin obsession for me. I've always been kind of bored with their stories. But Craven's Last Hunt is an awesome arc in the Spider-Man right. comics. And I'm telling you, there's more to explore here. And he hunts down, and he's at times, he hunts down other people besides Spider-Man. He sometimes he hunts down uh, criminals, too. He has been an anti-hero. He has worked with Spider-Man. He was associated with Squirrel Girl at times. So he's got like tentacles, lack of a Doc Ock reference there, but he's got tentacles throughout the Spider-Man universe that I think are a little more potent than you want to give him credit for. You know, I'm sorry he's an alpha straight male, uber alpha straight male, oh, but yeah, that look. shouldn't discount. I'm just throwing it out there. That shouldn't Listen. discount him from being considered a top tier villain. The very fact that I'm your co-host clearly shows I have no issue with alpha straight males. <laughs> but, I like musicals, though. I like musicals. <laughs> but I just, listen, having, 
I, I would say that like when you're building a Spider-Man story and then we can move on for this, but like <laughs> when you're building when you're building a Spider-Man story, uh, your issues with whiny teenagers aside, like the more the more interesting villains to me, not just in Spider-Man, but in any mm. character, is the personal connection. It's the personal like why do why do these two sure, people sure, butt sure. against each other? Fair point. And I just think that, you know, Norman and for sure there are times in the comics that the Norman and Harry stuff has been overmined or has been cheesy yeah. or has been a little bit too soap operatic, but in general, that dynamic of Norman being this like fa- this genius hard father who treats his son horribly but treats Peter really well and yet mm. Peter and Harry are friends that time that's an interesting dynamic from a character standpoint to play with uh Doc Ock is has always been just a very fascinating villain again like most of uh and and uh and then um Venom is kind of at the opposite end of things like just mm this like force of nature that's too much for Spider-Man to deal with that is just sort of yeah. singularly obsessed with him. Uh, so I think there's a lot of fun there. Look, you can have a ton of fun with Craven. And like I said, when yes. John Watts was going to do it, I was a thousand percent on board for it. I, I just yeah. question whether audiences at large will be super excited to see uh, Keanu Reeves leaping around from building to building and sniffing the trail of whatever villain it is he's hunting down. <laughs> Yeah, and you know, here's the thing. I know we'll move on from this, and Shannon, please chime in if you feel like it. But like, th- this is maybe why you cast someone like Keanu Reeves, Mike. You might have, you might be, you might have an excellent point here. This idea that well, he's not that well known, and people kind of just reduce him to a one note hunter character. Well, you cast someone like Keanu to get people interested in seeing what they can create here, and Keanu can play levels. Certainly, he's done so in other films, so he can get there. Constantine, I thought he was great, Constantine. You know, and so. Yeah. Well, that's, whoa. Don't do that, man. It's, <laughs> that's one role. That's one role. I listen, I love Keanu. I will Keanu, always love Keanu. Yeah. And he's great in constantly. I mean, he can play these roles that of you know, weightier stuff going on with yeah. Is he Daniel Day Lewis? No, but he could play a role like Craven within the world of what they've created. I mean, Tom Hardy was doing the best he could with that crappy Venom movie, uh, and it made $800 million. So, I mean, certainly there's a possibility here that someone like Keanu can bring something to this character and make it more interesting and make people get more interested in it. I mean, Iron Man was considered second tier in Marvel, and yeah. Robert Downey Jr. elevated it. So you just never know, and maybe this is the route they're taking. Mike, yeah, would you be more point. jazz for the Craven movie if Squirrel Girl was going to be in it as well? Ooh. I will be more jazzed for literally any movie on the planet if you tell me Squirrel Girl is also going to be in it. So you can be like, like, hey guys, we're going to reboot Schindler's List. Well, that's offensive. No. Squirrel Girl's in it. I'm like, well, now I'm interested. So, hey, I'm in. Let's just see. Who knows? <laughs> uh, for the record, Michael is Jewish and can so I, I want to make sure I don't have any problems down the road. Yeah. All right. Just so anyway. we're clear, everybody listening, I don't actually want a Schindler's List reboot. And I certainly don't want one with Squirrel Girl. Yeah, but it. But you would be interested. You'd want to know. Oh my god! You'd want to know what that was about. Uh, all right. Let's. Uh, <laughs> uh, speaking of creepy shit, let's move on. We'll find out what happens with, uh, with that. Uh, uh, certainly, we'll see if it's true. And the Illuminati at times uh, do break scoops that actually come true. So you know, it's it's one we should definitely keep a tab on uh, for sure. Uh, all right. So next up, uh, I, I think it's me here talking about uh, Michael's favorite subject. That is Zack Snyder's Justice League. Uh, Zack Snyder, you know, this is coming out now. It's been announced March 18th. We are literally just a little over a month away from this uh, film finally dropping. It's going to be a four-hour film on HBO Max. You know we're going to cover it. You know we're going to do a review here for the Geek Buddies. You just know it. We might even do a watch-along, which would really be a fun fun situation for sure uh but uh zach snyder building up the uh momentum building up the uh hype for the film coming out dropped a picture uh, of jared leto as the joker it is in black and white just to piss off some of those people who are upset about the stuff he puts in black and white this is a shot of him there he looks like uh the he looks like sweeney todd uh a little bit got a little blood on him looks a little bit like a butcher so to speak uh, of course sweeney todd was a barber but this is an incredible uh, look here, and he's come back to play the Joker. Jared Leto has this is a more of an update. Uh, I'm sorry, a closer look, a, a close up look at him uh, in this role. So, uh, I don't know. I like the shot, I like it. it. Doesn't tell me too much other than this is a more brutal Joker than we've seen before, aside from maybe Keanu uh, from uh, sorry, from uh, Joaquin Phoenix. So, gentlemen, what do you think about this picture? Do you like this that he's releasing this? Um, uh, does this get you any more hyped for it at all? For the movie, 
not at all because um i I do agree like that's a that's a really cool that is a really cool picture that's a really cool version of the joker that is is vastly different than the version of jared leto's joker we got in suicide squad Mm -hmm. um in terms of what it's going to mean for the movie how much is he gonna be in it? Like, mm. it's it's not like he's going to be peppered throughout the film. I, I might be wrong. I don't think I am. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think the, the issue that I think people had with Jared Leto's Joker had less to do with how it looked and more just the performance. Like it was yeah. just it, it was it was you know, you know kind of cranked up to eleven, and it just wasn't that interesting now that's not entirely on jared leto like i mean it, it's been well documented that most of his performance hit the cutting room floor so yeah some some of those more nuanced moments maybe we didn't get to see mm-hmm. uh but i mean it's a it's a great photo like it's a really really cool looking picture i just don't know how it's going to impact the final product that will be Zack snyder's justice league yeah a little background mike it will apparently take place in the nightmare world a dark vision of the future batman experiences where dark side the Lord of Apocalypse has decimated Earth, uh, and the Joker has narrowly escaped capture by Batman in the Suicide Squad. So this will be the first time these characters uh, will meet on screen in this version of uh, the universe. Yeah. So okay, here's what I think. Uh, I looking at this picture, it may it real. Yeah. This picture really sums up. Uh, and again, there are people who are super excited and be excited, and I'm yeah. excited that you're excited. Like I, I bear no one ill will for being excited for this movie. If you really wanted to know what Zach would have done and now you get to see it in this epic format, more power to you. I'm, I'm, I literally am truly stoked for you. Mm-hmm. Uh, this picture really sums up, I think for me, what my issue with Zack Snyder is. And that is that this picture looks great. It's awesome. Mm-hmm. There's an interesting story here. There's an interesting take on the Joker that I think could be really cool. I think Zack Snyder is a very good director. I think Zack Snyder makes things look gorgeous on screen. And I think most Zack Snyder movies have a lot of really good ideas in them. Mm. I just think that once you get to the execution of said images and ideas, it usually falls flat for me. Mm. And so looking at this, kind of echoing Shannon's point, like everyone's going crazy. Look at this Joker. It's the nightmare. This is what this is going to be this moment. I'm like, this is going to be a probably relatively small moment in a movie. Yeah. And again, it just feels like a wasted opportunity. Now, look, I know Zach in his defense a little bit. Maybe he had ideas of where he was going to take the Joker, had everything worked out differently and he doesn't yeah. get to do this. And this is his one opportunity. So he's going to he's going to shoot his shot and he's going to get his moment in there and he's going to get it in there as best he could. So I do understand that, like, this is not something that he could do down the road, but it yeah. just does feel like a a cool, interesting idea for the Joker, a cool take on the Joker, a cool look for the Joker mm. that is ultimately going to amount to like a couple seconds of something and then we move on to the next shiny object that people are excited about in seeing Justice <laughs> League. Yeah. That's a, that's a fair point you bring up, Mike. Absolutely. It, it probably will be a smart, a small uh, part of the movie. Uh, HBO Max released a press release for it. Joker appears in the new film during a sequence set on a ruined Earth after the alien tyrant Darkseid invades and decimates the planet. It's a dream sequence, a psychic vision experienced by Ben Affleck's Bruce Wayne that reveals what will happen if the superheroes fail to stop the onslaught. Joker is sort of the ghost of Christmas yet to come, supplying motivation through terror. So... Certainly, from that picture, terror does come in blood all over him and whatever, and I don't know what room he's sitting in, uh, so that that could play itself out. But Jared Leto coming back to reprise it, the one thing that I think will be here, unless this thing really just blows the doors off everybody's minds and is an incredible hit, I think this is Leto's last chance to do it, and he's doing it under Zack Snyder's tutelage, and Zack said that uh, the Joker was always in my plans to be in some version of uh, my five-part thing with uh, with uh, these characters, so he was always in there. So he's throwing him in for a little bit of a, a little bit of a moment here in the movie, and it'll be fun um, for those who like. It. I think it'll be fun to see him do it, and then that's it. Like I don't think we'll ever see Jared Leto do the Joker again. Remember, there had been all these talks about Harley Quinn and Joker and all this stuff, and I think this is pretty much it. Everybody coming back for the most part to give their approach to their characters a swan song swan song yeah ben affleck last appearance batman ray fisher certainly the last appearance of cyborg it seems like and uh and everyone else is going to continue on but and heck who knows what we'll do with cat what's going to happen with cavill but this is certainly his last attempt at the joker and then we're done with it so if nothing else it indicates that he's coming back into the version of the joker that the suicide squad had kind of hinted at 
but never really followed through on. And we don't know, Shannon, you bring up the cuts. We don't know if those were studio cuts or David Ayer cuts, right? We don't know because David Ayer says there's a cut of his film that is out there that is even more finished than Zack Snyder's was that could come out. And if we ever get that, maybe we'll find out um, if those scenes get put back in what the actual arc was going to be with Joker and Harley Quinn in that particular movie. I don't know. Yeah. yeah. All right. There we go. <laughs> So anyway, March 18th, it's coming. Get ready. Uh, and oh, don't get I can't wait. Yeah, I can't please. wait. <laughs> the idea that they're coming out it, and Falcon and Winter Soldier are coming out within, you know, like a day yeah, of yeah. each other. That's, a, that's, that's an interesting flex on, yeah, I don't on, understand on Marvel's that. part. <laughs> yeah, true. I don't understand that. Uh, and speaking of which, uh, let's get into Trailer Park. Shannon, please take us away. Trailers, trailers, trailers. This weekend we had the Super Bowl. We had the big game. And that's normally a time when we get some incredible trailers. Now, we did get some fun commercials this year. Yeah. Uh, uh, Timothy Chalamet is Edward Scissorhands. <laughs> um, Trailers-wise, it was uh, a little bit smaller than past years, mainly because it's still uncertain what's going to happen with uh with uh, american cinemas but the trailers that we did get we got a the first trailer for m night Shyamalan's old we got <laughs> a 30 second uh, uh quick trailer for fast nine the fast saga a new one for ryan the last dragon and one for nobody that uh stars bob odenkirk and is actually from uh, john wick creator uh Derek colson he actually wrote this script so they're all 30 seconds they're all super quick Ryan the Last Dragon, you know, pretty much everyone who's on board is on board. Like what we saw yeah. was great. It, yeah. it, it, it's going to be a blast. Um, nobody, that seems like it could be a really interesting movie. Mm -hmm. uh, Fast Nine, you know, that is not my franchise. John, John loves it. <laughs> there are things about it. I don't understand how a car can flip on its side and then be propelled through a building, I think. Yeah. <laughs> but I know this is, this is a world that some people love. Yeah, you don't go into this with logic, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah. uh, and the trailer that I thought was interesting, and I think figure we'll talk Falcon and Winter Soldier once we go through the first four, mm -hmm. um, was old, the, the M. Night Shyamalan movie. Now, it seems like it's sort of a uh, the, the horror version, uh, Benjamin Button type thing, where people get on this beach and they start to rapidly age and the, the fallout from that. Um, M. Night Shyamalan, you know, he kind of got everybody back on board with splits. Um, and then he kind of lost him again with Glass. I mean, after watching Split, finding out that it was part of the, un the Unbreakable Universe, it was like, oh my gosh, this seems, oh, that's awesome. They're going to bring Bruce Willis back. They're going to bring <laughs> Sam Jackson back. And then you saw Glass, and it was like, oh, God, maybe, maybe he just should have stopped <laughs> with Split. Um, old will be interesting. I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's got an interesting cast, um, but big game spots this year. What did you guys think? <laughs> Uh, what kind of similar, think, Mikey? Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, right. Uh, I think uh, I think uh, Raya, like you said, I'm on board. It was more awesome, like more awesome stuff. Super excited. I think nobody looks really cool. Uh, I think that uh, Fast Nine is I also not really my franchise, but I give it up every time I see whatever crazy stuff they get to do. I. I think I had mentioned this before the last time we talked about uh, the Fast and the Furious franchise, but when I was at Hasbro, I was lucky enough to go to Universal one day where they did a giant sort of presentation for us about Fast and the Furious, and they kind of went through the DNA of the brand and how they look at it and how it's all about family and it's all about when you're in your vehicle, you're a superhero. Like those are the two things that kind of like, that's the, that's the secret sauce to the franchise. And so every time I watch the trailers or watch anything, like you're, you, you see how that's what they bank on and that's why it works. Like to Shannon's point, like it's ridiculous. It's over the top. I'm sure there's lots of people out there who think that about superhero movies or Star Wars movies, but you know, you, that, you see a trailer, you're like, here's the family moment. Here's the moment where it's like, it's all about family. We're getting back together. I love you guys. And then you see a car do some death-defyingly ridiculous thing that cars can't do, but you're like, yeah, that's the superhero part of it. So watching it, it's like, I, I find the Fast and the Furious franchise so fascinating because I'm so uninterested in it, but I like respect that they know what they are and they make that shit work for them. Like, mm -hmm. I can't wait for the trailer for Fast 22. <laughs> Let's get together, old bitches like i don't know like it's like <laughs> somebody get in the golf cart and then they like flip in the air like i don't know it's gonna be crazy um i could see it i could see it <laughs> uh and then old is is uh, old is like 
M. Night Shyamalan, and I'm sad to say this, has now gotten to the point where I watch a trailer and I'm like, that looks really cool. Who did it? Oh, man, come on. <laughs> like, it just, I, you're right. Sometimes, like, with a split or something, like, he, he hits it and you're like, okay, there, that's, 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 that's good. But he has so almost become a parody of his own thing. So, like, watching the trailer, I'm like, okay, we're on an island. Everyone's aging. What's the twist? Well, that was crazy. Okay. Like, it, you know, and yeah. so it looks interesting. I am sure I will check it out. But he definitely has sort of almost become the, uh, wow, I wish this was somebody else doing their take on an M. Night Shyamalan movie and not M. Night Shyamalan. Yeah. <laughs> I, yeah, I mean, I liked the trailer, but I'm with you, Mike. It's uh, I always hold my expectations i'm always cautiously optimistic it's going to be good I, you know I, I remember i i i convinced you guys to come see split with me yeah because you guys weren't you know down with uh shamalan at the time shamalan had not had hits i mean the last airbender had really left a lot of people's uh, bad taste people's mouth happening some people hated the village some people love the village you know and lady in the water uh maybe one person we know liked that movie so it was like it's that is that kind of situation uh there with m night at the time so but then you guys came with me and you guys enjoyed it glass Kind of, a lot of people didn't like glass i liked it but i get that a lot of people didn't like it uh so in the end uh it, it's back to like well should we or should we not but then this orphan show on apple plus has gotten a second season people have enjoyed some of the horror in that so this he gets another shot at this thing this is one of those things that's this is where m night i think works best small budget small uh, setting not uh, not too much uh, dancing around like that that uh, uh, elevator movie he produced that I thought was really good. There he can work within those situations, kind of, and maybe we'll get the best from him. And plus, this cast is absolutely fantastic. Going down the line, Rufus Sewell, Thomas and McKenzie, who we saw in, of course, in uh, in uh, Jojo Rabbit, Eliza Scandal. And speaking of Schindler's List, Mike and Beth Davids, who played the maid uh, that uh, uh, you know uh, Ray finds his obsession with, Alex Wolf in this, uh, Gail Garcia Bernal, Vicky Krebs. Uh, from Phantom Thread um, uh, and a bunch of other people involved. Alexis Swinton, who was just in Emergence, that show Emergence, that was really cool. So all of the, it's a good cast. So, but will he make it work? I'm with you. I don't know. Uh, and I'm in on Raya. Um, I'm in on the Bob Odenkirk thing. By the way, quietly becoming a goddamn good actor, by the way. I mean, the stuff in the post and then to see him, what he's done with Saul, Better Call Saul, and then now this. Don't be surprised if he becomes this American Liam Neeson all of a sudden in the twilight of his career to be playing these kind of action heroes. Because that trailer is great. It's totally believable in the world that you're creating. And so you're like, wow, this is doing a nice job with this shit. So, you know, you know it would have been interesting to see if it had been able to have been released when it was originally when it was really hmm. supposed to come out. Because yeah. the first the first bit of marketing that came out for it, it really seemed more like a falling down situation. It yeah. didn't seem like he was actually sort of this retired assassin. And now we see it's got more shades of like the long kiss goodnight that you yeah, have, right. this, you know, I mean, without the amnesia. I mean, it's right. this guy who is who has has left this life and 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 hidden hidden his past away. And for whatever reason, he has to he has to start kicking ass again. Um, yeah. But I think the trailer that we're all the most excited to talk about yeah. is the Falcon and the Winter Soldier. So I don't know if this actually played during the game like i, no, I know it was released not the full that. trailer the, yeah, they the did a yeah trailer. they did a mini trailer and then said full yeah. trailer is now out online and you can go check it out i mean so when these disney plus series were first announced and this is some of what john and i talked about last night on outlaw nation mm -hmm. um when they were first announced falcon and winter soldier is the thing that i was the most excited about i i'm for the mcu mcu i'm a steve rogers guy i'm like i cannot wait to see how this how this story plays out and the more that came out i just wasn't that into it i wasn't sure about their chemistry as a whole mainly based off that last moment in the previous trailer where they at Anthony Mackie's talking about his, you know, his uh, cyborg brain. And I'm like, this seems, the, 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 the comedy seems really forced right here. Starting with this trailer, I, I feel like my, my worries have, have, have subsided a great deal. Putting them together with a therapist and you get some really fun, playful exchanges, especially after Bucky has been knocked off that truck. I'm like, oh God, this, okay, so these are the guys that we saw in Civil War. Like, and, and what I told John last night, I'm like, they... If this dynamic continues, they have a strong possibility of becoming the Riggs and Murtaugh of the MCU. Mm. But what do you guys think? Yeah, Mike? I mean, I'm super excited. It's going to be interesting. Uh, 
it's it's going to be such a different show from WandaVision. You know, yes. I think that I think that as we are all in the midst of trying to unravel the mystery that is WandaVision and speculating on every single moment and every single tease and every single image in the background. And this feels much more like it's going to be a straight down the line Marvel action movie, which I don't say in a bad way, because I think that this is what's great about the MCU at this point is that WandaVision is an offshoot of kind of the weirder parts of the MCU, the Doctor Strange, the the Mind Stones, the Infinity stuff and you look at you know it's it's Falcon it's Winter Soldier it's Agent 13 it's Zemo like this is a continuation of the Cap movies this yep. is a continuation of like of a you know if you look at uh, Captain America the first Avenger you look at Winter Soldier you look at Civil War it is a what does it mean to do to be a hero what does it mean to do the right thing what does it mean when the world is telling you what you're doing is wrong and you know it's right and yeah. Everything about this story that they're hinting at seems like it's about that. Like, as much as I agree with Shannon that the interplay between the two of them is a lot of fun, them with the therapist is just great Marvel character-based comedy. Uh, it, I'm actually really curious about sort of what's driving this story forward. Like, Zemo coming back post-Civil War, where he more or less did break the Avengers. Yeah. Uh, he succeeded in his plan as basic and simple as it was, and him showing up and in the trailer saying, you know, the world doesn't need superheroes, and that his mission isn't complete, and that he still wants to destroy these people in their lives. And knowing that in Civil War, the way he did that wasn't with a bomb, wasn't with a super soldier of his own, but it was like using what was really in the world against them, like using yeah. the fact that Bucky had killed Tony's parents uh, and turning Tony and Cap against each other. And I think that here he's going to do the same thing. I mean, there's been a lot of talk and a lot of suspicion that because uh, Falcon is now the new Captain America, they're going to follow what they did in the comics a lot and kind of deal with systemic racism in the superhero world. Mm -hmm. And because we know in the history of comic books that there were also black soldiers who were experimented on with the super soldier yeah. serum before they gave it to Steve Rogers, I have a suspicion that what Zemo is going to use against them and against uh, against him, against him Falcon being the new uh, Captain America might be some of that stuff. So that's all just conjecture on my part. That's me watching something and going, this is what I hope we get to see. If that's not it, I'm sure it's still going to be awesome. But the fact that that's where I suspect this is going based on what these trailers are kind of starting to reveal, I'm super into it. Yeah, I like the fact that you've got three point of views that are gonna, or four point of views that are really gonna be highlighted throughout this series. Series, right? You got you got Falcon, you got Winter Soldier, you got uh, uh, Baron Zemo, uh, and you got Homie Plant, who's uh, Wyatt Russell's character. Uh, you got him. He adhering more to a government that wants to use him to implement whatever political ideology that happens to be uh, consuming the government at the time. Whereas Steve was more of a person who questioned authority, you're imagining this person who will probably be the Captain America they want is a Captain America who is going to do whatever the government wants, right? Kind of like we saw in Dark Knight Returns with Superman, adhering to whatever Reagan told him to do. I think we're going to see that kind of... So juxtapose, as you said, Mikey, with the idea of a black man looking at what that shield represents as many people, and we're, just, and we're not discovering, but we're hearing louder and louder finally, and people are listening to the experiences of generations of black Americans and what they think when they look at the flag, what they see that it symbolizes. That's going to be a fun approach. And then Bucky, who's... Remember... Bucky is still a displaced, out-of-time person, right? This is a guy who's at times vacillating between reality and non-reality and then, of course, grew up in the 1940s, but all of a sudden, but of course, has been brought into the modern age and doing whatever, kept alive for numerous decades to essentially be an assassin, waking up from that. So what's that experience like for him? So all of these things are going to be thrown into the mix that I think are fun. Plus, we get Emily Van Camp, and I can't remember the actress's name who's playing the uh, the, the woman who's fighting on the on the uh, top of the 18-wheeler uh, 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 and kicking uh, uh, Winter Soldier's butt. I don't remember her name, but we're going to get that in this. So to me, the trailer looks fantastic, but it's going to be foundational with the interaction between the two guys. That's going to be the foundation of this all. Everything stems out from that. But you're right to point out the Captain America aspect of it all. Falcon and Winter Soldier, but that Captain America thing is going to loom large throughout the whole series. And they're spending $25 million per episode that was reported the other Ooh. day. That is a movie. A movie. Yeah. So I, I imagine these are going to be an hour long 
each of these episodes. If this half an hour for twenty five million, that would shock the shit out of me, to be honest with you. I think they did say that Cap, uh, Falcon, Winter Soldier, and Loki are both going to be closer to that one hour. One yeah, hour time. that makes sense to me. That makes sense. Like Rome was spent. Remember when Rome got canceled because they were spending three million per show? Uh, this is twenty five million per episode. <laughs> it's madness to even think about. But I'm excited for it. I can't wait to see it. Certainly looking forward to seeing uh, more. And that's around the corner. And we will have reviews here on the Outlaw, uh, sorry, on the Geek Buddies on the Outlaw Nation channel for sure. There will be reviews from us. We're still figuring out who we want to bring on as our fourth, but we will definitely be having reviews uh, for that uh, when it happens. So, And it will be dropping on March 19th. 19th. <laughs> the day after <laughs> Zack Snyder's Justice League. So, uh, gentlemen, stay in town. There's going to be a lot of work to do. There's going to be a lot of work to do, I think, on both those days. So, uh, we'll see. All right, let's take a quick break, yes, and then jump into our main topic, shall we? Do, 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 do. Um, all right, so we're back uh, to talk about this main topic. Uh, you know, as we came, uh, woke up this morning, we got uh, uh, this uh, notice on Twitter from uh, Charisma Carpenter. She was an actress who was in Buffy and Angel under uh, Josh we Joss Whedon's direction. Uh, she posted a, a two tweet thread uh, picture with pictures of her statement about her experiences working with Joss Whedon on multiple sets uh, and uh, hashtagged it. I stand with Ray Fisher with two simple words, my truth. Uh, and she spoke about the unacceptable quote unquote onset behavior she endured during her time with, um, uh, with Joss Whedon on the sets of Buffy the Vampire Slayer and on Angel. Uh, she remember that she played, uh, she was debuted, the, the show debuted in 1997 on the WB network. She played Sunnyvale, Sunnydale High School snob turned Scooby gang member Cordelia Chase on the Critically Acclaimed series, which transformed the cast and its creator, that's for sure, into fan favorites within the genre community. Behind the scenes, though, Carpenter says that Whedon frequently abused his power on set while he found his conduct con misconduct amusing it only served to intensify my performance anxiety disempower me alienate me alienate me, me from my peers the disturbing incidents triggered a chronic physical condition from which i still suffer she spoke about it here on uh, both of these uh, on this twitter thread as we mentioned earlier michael let's just stop here let's address this here by the way this is the second part of it let's address it here you look at this situation you hear what she had to say what she spoke about the how in depth she got into this situation what is your feeling when you hear this you've been on sets you've worked with people uh who have been show runners uh you know you're seeing this coming out more and more the ray fisher thing so a lot of people were on its side some people uh went with wb wb saying the investigation's over we're moving on so what's your feeling when you hear this uh, and read these statements from charisma carpenter uh, sadly my statement like the feeling that i feel mostly is uh not shock what's the like it's just yeah. like it's just like like it, none of this reads as surprising the way that our yeah. industry has worked for a really long time the way it sort of continues to work is that uh if you can deliver the creative goods, if you're going to have that show that gets that avid fan base, that you know that there's, there's followers and people that want to be a part of the worlds that you're creating, yeah. uh, you get a lot of leeway. And yeah. you, get, you get away with a lot of stuff. And I think in the case of Joss Whedon, what we're seeing with, and again, we don't know the details of Ray Fisher, and, and aside from what she wrote, we don't know the specifics beyond that of what Charisma Carpenter's talking about, yeah. but it does fall into this category of, it's not somebody who is doing some overt sort of physical abuse per se. A right. lot of this falls under a gray area is what some people would try and call a gray area, which mm -hmm. is a, I'm saying things, but I was joking. You're a sensitive actress. I didn't really mean that. It was a, it was a rough day, but of course I'm a friend to women. Like there, mm -hmm. this is, this is that area that falls under the category of here's all the excuses that I, as a man can use to say why I didn't really mean those things. Yeah. And I think that it's great that she spoke up. I think that, you know, Ray Fisher has sort of, to, and I, we talked about this a few weeks ago. I mean, Ray Fisher for a while was like just an island out there on his own. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, you know, Jason Momoa finally stepped up and kind of said he was behind him. And the the sort of lack of support for Joss from the rest of the Justice League cast kind of spoke for itself. But True. not everybody was stepping up and saying this is exactly what happened. Like you, you, And that in and of itself speaks to the fact that, look, as as 
as popular and in demand as a lot of actors and actresses are, there's a lot of them that still behind the scenes have that fear. Like if I speak out against a director, if I yep. speak out against the studio, yep. like I'm just not, I'm not touching this. And so for Charisma Carpenter, whose career you could easily say was built on Buffy, which is the world yep. that Joss, you know, uh, brought not to life, I guess. Well, you know, brought brought into brought to popularity, kind of made part of like the massive mainstream. Yeah. Um, I think it's super brave of her, and I think it's brave of her to sort of support Ray Fisher in this way. Uh, and then you know, right after she kind of came out, Amber Benson, who was also on Buffy, kind of came out and mm -hmm. echoed, you know, what she's uh, what Charisma said is a hundred percent true. I'm not the only voice. Uh, yeah. And then you know, Sarah Michelle Gellar also came out later today. Uh, after that, and yeah, there it is. Uh, you know, while I'm proud to have my name associated with Buffy Summers, I don't want to be forever associated with the name Joss Whedon. I'm more focused on raising my family and surviving. I will not be making further statements, but I stand with the survivors of abuse and I'm proud for them speaking out. And so, again, you see a statement that is not specifically damning. She's not adding her own voice or her own point of view to the story. Right. But even, but, but the woman who is Buffy Summers saying she doesn't want to be associated with Joss Whedon kind of speaks for itself as well. So yep. I think this is definitely an area where you're like, look, it, there's enough people talking here. Like there's no more room for, well, Ray Fisher is just mad because of whatever, or right. this is this, like right. these people are standing up to stand with each other. It's sad that a black man has to have backup to be able to be believed in this time and this era. It's still a shame. White women have to come forward to to defend him, to support him in this situation, and that's unfortunate. But I honor these women coming forward, certainly, and Joss Whedon from that time. And, Mike, he's not the only one. Obviously, we saw what's happening with Weinstein. I'm sure there are quite a lot of creators who were around in the 90s, 2000s, 80s, 70s, what have you, who've done pretty horrendous shit to their female actresses, to their female uh, uh, ladies or, on set, uh, in a production staff, and in front of the camera, I'm sure. Yes, go ahead. Well, I was going to say, or, or to Ray Fisher. I mean, like, the thing yeah. about what Joss has People done, clearly, yeah. you know, like, it's not just a, uh, it's not just to the women, although that's 100% true. It's not just to the people of color, although that's true. It right. just seems with Joss Whedon, it's a systemic, like, I treat people shitty. Yeah. And Shannon, across the board. Remember, and remember, Shannon, his ex-wife wrote a pretty strong missive a few years ago, really outing him for some of the shit he pulled while they were together and some of the ways he went about cheating on her with multiple actresses and what have you. And just to add a little more thing, this just came up. Michelle Trachtenberg chimed in on Sarah Michelle Geller's comments and said, thank you, Sarah Michelle Geller, for saying this. I am brave, of, brave enough now as a 35-year-old woman to repost this because this must be known as a teenager with his not appropriate behavior very not appropriate so doesn't go into detail but certainly you can make i think you can glom from that what you need to glom from that was he inappropriate with was he physical with her was he did he touch her in areas that he sexually assault her we don't know but certainly the implication there is some inappropriate stuff occurred either to michelle trachtenberg or in, or in front of michelle trachtenberg shannon uh what are your thoughts on all of this as we speak about it and read about it well you know the, being on sets working on a show um the person at the top sets the tone Mm -hmm. um, there was a show that I did several years ago where I did a few episodes and the lead actor who was also an executive producer, he just wasn't a good guy. Like he, mm -hmm. he was just like, he didn't do anything close to what is, has been, um, alleged against Joss Whedon. Mm -hmm. That being said, he was an asshole. Like he, he, he wasn't, he wasn't fun to work with. He wasn't yeah. fun to be around the days that he was not there were better days and it wasn't just from my point of view as a uh, as an actor who got to be on a few episodes it was from his co-stars these people that are not number one on the call sheet but they're number two they're number mm -hmm. three everyone's having a better day when this guy is not there so when you hear about uh and, and you know the person that can set the tone it could be number one on the call sheet it can also be the showrunner yeah. it can also be the person that is uh, the buck stops with them in terms of the production. Yeah. And the thing about the whole absolute power corrupts absolutely 100%. Because as Mike said, as long as you kind of deliver the goods at the end of the day, that's the that tends to be the most important thing from the business side. They just want to know that you're making your day. Um, yeah. And for Charisma Carpenter, who was never the star, like, you yeah. know, she, I don't know where she was on the Buffy on the Buffy call sheet, but on Angel, she might have been number two. She might have been number yeah, three. Behind Boreanaz, yeah. 
Um, the thing with speaking out is these guys have the power to affect your career mm -hmm. going forward. Mm -hmm. I mean, you look at the interviews that Mira Sorvino gave that yeah, right. Peter Jackson was interested in her for Lord of the Rings and Weinstein shut that down. Right. So as a performer or, or as anyone, as a subordinate, you you will make excuses because it, you're, you're concerned about your own personal well-being. Yeah. And 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 there's nothing wrong with that. Like you right. want to make sure there's no guarantees in this business that you're going to have a job next week. If you get labeled as difficult, mm -hmm. if you get labeled as argumentative, you know, I mean, the people that are asking about you for former, for future jobs, they're not asking you. Yeah. They're asking the people that you worked with previously. Yeah. And if you, you piss off the wrong person, they might say, Oh Yeah totally totally not worth working with don't hire them right. so it makes sense that people do not say anything for a very very long time this is a sorry mike go ahead yeah no no go ahead go ahead i was just gonna this is a cousin to oh she's really difficult to work with this is like a cousin connected to that you know this idea i want to be able to do what i want to do to this woman and grab her butt or or or, or fondle her in some way or be over affection overly affectionate that makes them uncomfortable because i'm indulging my instincts to be able to do that because i'm i'm cock of the walk i'm the king on the set here i can do what i like and uh, if that person rejects my advances or is uncomfortable or pushes me away then i can talk crap about them later and say oh this person's difficult to work with if you know what i mean so there's the it's a very and, and the thing about this situation also gentlemen is this is even more insidiously toxic than some of these other things we've heard of because this was supposed to his shows were supposed to stand for female empowerment female strength female independence you know coming out there and be a, be kind of a a um a slap in the face to the male led superhero type of stuff and here he is doing the toxicity uh, of a of, of of men on sets uh, abusing these women verbally and maybe physically and what have you it's even more of a of a mind fuck when you think about it and the sadness of it all that even something that stood for something so powerful might have some of his power taken away, kind of like with J.K. Rowling in the Harry Potter situation. Well, it's a, yeah, I mean, well. it's a hundred, it's a hundred percent like the J.K. Rowling. I mean, look, we we yeah. will. I mean, we're we're definitely well into the area of cancel culture and this mm -hmm. whole thing that is a huge debate that we all debate right now, which is, oh well, is this all uh, SJW political stuff? Like, are we just going to come come after Joss? Are we coming after J.K. Rowling? Are we doing this, or uh, is this a people trying having to finally like? Uh, own what they say, own yeah. what they do, own what, own what they've done. And look, I don't know the answer. Like, I don't think anybody yeah. really does know the answer. But to your point um, on Buffy specifically, and I think along what Sarah Michelle Gellar said in the way she said it, I think it's a hard thing to do. It would be great if in real life, the people who were shitty were also shitty at their jobs. Yeah. Like, it would be yeah. great. It would make things a lot easier. Yeah. It would make things a lot easier if the assholes who treated people shitty on set also made shitty movies. Yep. But sometimes that's not the case. Uh, sometimes you can say horrible things about trans people and still create one of the most compelling wizarding fantasy series in the past generation. Sometimes you treat people absolutely like garbage on set, apparently, uh, and you create uh, one of the most popular enduring TV shows about a, about a vampire slayer. You know, so I mean, it, it's, it's challenging because I know so many people that uh, so many women that for them, Buffy was their show. Like they grew yeah. up on Buffy. That was their girl power. That was the woman they looked up to. Uh, people who love Firefly, people who love all these mm. things. And mm -hmm. I think it's the same thing that the Harry Potter fandom is dealing with right now or many people in the Harry Potter fandom where you're like, the person who created the thing that I love, I don't really love anymore, but I yeah. still love the thing. And I'm trying to square where I feel with that. And I think that the more that these stories come out, the more we find out these things, I think that's going to be a thing that a lot of people in a lot of fandoms are going to struggle with. And I think yeah. that it's hard. I don't really know what the answer is yet. Yeah, I don't think there is a concrete answer, Mike. Aside from all these creators coming in, stop doing this shit. If you get to be in a showrunner position, elevate people, elevate women, elevate people of color, hear their stories, hear their points of views, and respect 
their situations. You know, Charisma went on to speak about it, about when she got pregnant. She said that he, he manipulatively weaponized my womanhood and my faith against me. He proceeded to attack my character, mock my religious beliefs, accused me of sabotaging the show, and then unceremoniously fired me the following season once I gave birth. And this was after what she claimed multiple attempts by her and her agents to let Joss Whedon know that she had gotten pregnant. That she wanted to have this child. She was gonna, in fact, he asked her, Are you gonna keep it or are you gonna get rid of it to stay on the show? Like those are those kinds of things. You're like, wow. Uh, and I think all of us have had access to toxic work environments and have been around people who like, you know, threaten your job or 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 say, like, if you don't do this, you know, it's not gonna look good for you. But those kings, we've all had those experiences. This has taken it to the next uh, level. And some people might say, well, why did she go on to do Angel if she was experiencing this? And I think it speaks to Shannon's point earlier. As an actor, you never know, especially a young actor, that's who they prey on is your insecurity, your low self-esteem, your concern that you might not get a job after this if you don't go forward with this person. She said, a part of me still sought his validation. Uh, and only recently do I understand the complexities of this demoralized thinking our society industry vilify the victims and glorify the abusers for their accomplishments. The onus is on the abused with an expectation to accept and adapt to be employable. No accountability to the transgressor who sails on unscathed, right? So this mm -hmm. is the thing at the end of the day you take a look at. Yeah, uh, who's going to chime in? Mike, were you chiming in or Shannon? No, it's not no. in my head. <laughs> okay, I don't know. I don't, but Ray no. Fisher issued a statement. Sorry, Mikey. Ray Fisher issued a statement said, Charisma Carpenter is one of the bravest people I know. I am forever grateful for her courage and for her lending her voice to the Justice League investigation. Read her truth, share her truth, protect her at all costs. Uh, quote, it is time. A, greater than E, accountability, greater than entertainment. I stand with Charisma. So, Mikey, sorry, go ahead. No, I was going to say, uh, I think that um, you know, like I just like I, it's it's just echoing what I said before. Is I think to your point, like it bothers me that an actor who's trying to make their living is forced into this position of either standing up for what's right or being employed. I think it just yeah. it sucks that that is the decision that they need to make, and I think that that's where. Ray Fisher standing up and then having Charisma Carpenter, having these other actresses from, from the Joss Whedon universe step up behind him, I think it's showing, uh, not to be cheesy about it, but like this is, this is what we see in the movies that we love and the books that we read, which is you stand up and do the right thing. Stand up and be brave and trust that people will stand up with you. Like, I yeah. think it's time that we as fans of these fantasy universes stop idolizing the people that are creating the universes and start emulating the characters within those universes. And I yeah. think that Ray Fisher and Charisma Carpenter uh, and a lot of people are starting to do that. And I think that as fans, we should follow suit. And I'm not telling you what that means. I don't think that that means that you have to burn all your Buffy DVDs. I don't think that, like, I mean, I think that on the opposite end of the spectrum, I think we as fans sometimes start to get mad when everybody doesn't respond to this news the exact same way that we do. Right. So I right. think that this is these these fandoms are very personal to us. We all love these characters. We love these stories for really personal reasons. And so navigating how you deal with that is a very personal choice. But I do think that as we watch these people stand up bravely, think about what Cap would do. Think about what Harry would do, not what J.K. Rowling would do, not what Joss Whedon would do, not even what Kevin Feige and some of the other people that are at this point good guys would do. But these characters that we love, like what would they do? And that's how we should respond. And that's how we should react. Yeah. Shannon? Yeah. Very well said. Agreed. Yeah. yeah a thousand percent. Uh, I'm, I'm sure there will be more people coming forward. I, and I wonder when the men are going to come forward. That's the other part of this thing. Does Did David, do, did David Boreanaz witness stuff on set? that he was uncomfortable with. You know, he's on a popular show on CBS. Certainly his voice carries power. He could speak about it as well. Do any of the men, I mean, Serenity, as you mentioned, Firefly, any of the, does, does Nathan Fillion come forward with this? Alan Tudyk, do these men come forward and speak about what they witnessed? Because as you said, Michael, earlier, it was, Ray was out there for a bit before someone else showed up on that uh, branch to sit with him in that tree, Jason Momoa being the one. But even Affleck didn't say too much. Cavill didn't say too much. Gal Gadot said, I think she said she stands with him, but didn't say speak uh, uh, about it too much. And even someone like Gal Gadot or Affleck has to kind of watch their P's and Q's as well. And that's unfortunate yeah. truth here. And that need that shit needs to end. That shit needs to end once and for all. And I, I think we're seeing a turning of the tide. I think we just we won't know for another 10 years if it actually has turned. Yeah. Anything else? Yeah. All right. 
No, I, I mean, look, I think. <laughs> sorry, you fro- oh, sorry, it froze. It froze for just a second. Okay, uh, no, worries, no. <laughs> I think that uh, I think that um, to what your to your point. Look, for better or for worse. Well, it, it is for worse. There's no good about it. But like, we live in a world where like guys are listened to more than women. Yes. And and white people are listened to more than people of color. Like that's not me making some kind of broad PC statement. Like that is pretty factual. And yeah. so I think you're absolutely right that it's it's sometimes a lot easier for the white straight guy to be like, oh yeah, I saw this thing on set. Mm, kind of made me uncomfortable, but like I like we have a good relationship. Like I'm yeah. fine. Uh, so I'm not going to do anything. And I think that to what I was saying before, I think that like that's not how our heroes would act so that's not yes. how we should act I, I i keep thinking of the uh you know the captain america civil war quote about uh mm, what is it the tree i'm not gonna say it right i'm not gonna say it right uh you know oh yeah it doesn't matter doesn't matter what the press says doesn't matter what the politicians or the or the news says doesn't matter if the whole country decides that something is wrong if if something is right uh, you know, you sit there and you tell them to move. Like, I think, not going to read the whole thing because I couldn't read it because it was too small. But, <laughs> I mean, that is, but that is the sentiment. It's the Ray yeah. Fisher did something that I think ultimately is going to be seen as really, really brave and not selfish yep. and not for his career. And I think other people are now standing with him. And I think, I hope more people do. And I wonder if this finally puts pressure on WB to it. I'm certainly Joss Whedon left the HBO show he was doing, uh, but I wonder if this puts more pressure on WB to kind of relook at this situation. Certainly, they haven't spoken about Ezra Miller. They haven't spoken a, a damn word about that. And I wonder if this whole situation—they've made it very clear they don't want Ray Fisher around. And so, and Hamada has made this decision very clear as well. And Ray has gone after Hamada. So, is this a burgeoning uh, uh, battle? that is going to have more soldiers show up on Ray Fisher's side of things and force WB to finally confront this and speak about it. We shall see. I, I wonder. I mean, I think, I think Warner Brothers has no intention of working with Joss Whedon anytime soon. I think, I sure. think with them, like the Joss Whedon, Ray Fisher of it all, I think they want to get themselves as far away from it as possible. And they're just circling the wagons and, uh, depending on your point of view, and I don't have inside information, so I don't know, either protecting or defending Jeff Johns. Yeah. I mean, I think that's yeah. really where I think I think they're they're circling the wagons and saying, let's separate ourselves from this as far as possible from both of these guys. And hopefully we can continue on over here and maybe that'll work for them. Maybe it won't work for them. We'll see what other people have to say. For sure. Shannon, any final words for you? Yeah, I was going to say on, you know, it, w- within within certain jobs, self-preservation is a big thing. Yeah. And certainly. and that's why a lot of people don't speak up. That's why they don't say things. So uh, when someone does take that step, to, does put themselves out there, take that risk, you really hope that they get support from the big guns as well. Yeah, we'll see. We'll see. We hope that happens. And, and for those of you who are in who have gotten out of toxic work environments, you know, once you were in it, you were in it and you had to survive and pay bills and do whatever. It's only when you get out of it that your eyes kind of wake up at what you were enduring. So hopefully you can extend some of that sympathy and understanding to these people who are speaking out about their experiences with Joss Whedon. All right, uh, let's wrap this thing up. Thank you all so much for watching or listening to this episode of The Geek Buddies. We can't thank you enough for taking the chance on us or for continuing to be on The Geek Buddies train. Shannon, what do we have to tell? Yeah, if you'd like to follow us on social media, on Twitter, it's at geek underscore buddies, on Instagram at the underscore geek underscore buddies if you'd like to follow me on social media on twitter it's at shannon underscore mcclung on instagram at shannon the geek buddy if you would like to follow mr vogel it is at mk2 and if you would like to follow mr roca it is at the roca says mikey uh like johnny said at the beginning of the show we are thrilled to have so many people coming in and finding us through our reviews we are thrilled that we have so many people checking out the wandavision reviews we hope you stay with us through all of the amazing tv shows that are coming out in the next year and if you are checking out geek buddies for the first time because of the wandavision reviews then here's some things that you can do if you enjoyed the conversation uh like the post down below subscribe to johnny's page check out our other awesome and amazing geek buddies content leave a comment below uh as you guys know we check all the comments we read what you guys have to say uh we love that our comment chains are like a lot cooler and more fun and more interesting (laughs) and less toxic than most other chains like we actually like that you guys engage with each other and don't go crazy so let's keep more of those conversations going (laughs) down below uh and then the best thing that you guys can do uh if you do follow us on twitter as shannon said um repost this video retweet this video uh we've had so many wonderful people in the past few weeks saying how much they love the wandavision reviews how their that is their favorite review online um 
we want the same love coming from the Geek Buddy stuff. So retweet this, send it around, tell people to check it out. Uh, we really appreciate it. We really appreciate all of you. And that is what we've got to say. <laughs> Absolutely. And certainly Shannon got a taste of that last night and you got a taste of it as well when you were a guest on the Outlaw Nation show, Mikey. So many people coming forward to say how much they've been enjoying Geek Buddies. So uh, thank you all so much for doing that. All right, we're out of here. Much love to you. Make sure you practice your social distancing, wear your mask, take care of yourselves, and then come back and join us uh, for our WandaVision review this weekend. And next week for another brand new episode, we'll be going live with the Geek Buddies next week. We'll announce the date and the time, but we are going live next week with the Geek Buddies and we'll talk to you then. Take care yourself some much love oh uh, from the ah, geek <laughs> buddies <gasps> hey! Hey!